So good morning, Craig. Uh, good morning, James. Thank you very much for doing this again. Um, uh, as per usual, if um, if you could just tell us a bit about Vietnam Holding, please, to start off with, and then we'll cut to some questions. Uh, yeah, so Vietnam Holding is one of uh, three London-listed Vietnam uh, investment tr trusts. We're last week the winner of the CityWire Award, the best single country emerging market fund. So we're pleased to have some uh, silver in the trophy cabinet. It's a very uh, focused uh, fund. We've built a concentrated portfolio of high conviction names, bottom up as well as top down, good companies, well managed businesses, top down. We're really looking at the businesses that are, are leaders and champions in the core themes for Vietnam. Made in Vietnam, a lot of manufacturing for export, growing consumer base and growing uh, modernizing uh, economy. So we've outperformed over one, three, five and 10 years. Year to date, we're up about 17%. That's about 5% above the index. And over three years, we're up about 56%. So 30% above the index. So we're demonstrating good outperformance. And that's partly because you know, we're very focused, nimble team in terms of our decision making and following our conviction themes along. Uh, we're not an index, though. We're an actively managed business. And we think for somewhere like Vietnam, you know, if you're going to do the research to look at Vietnam, don't bother with an, with an ETF. They tend to underperform. Uh, you know, why not let a team on the ground in Vietnam do all the hard work for you? And, and yet it can be bought very easily uh, through the premium segment of the London Stock Exchange. As with all uh, uh, Vietnam funds, they do trade, and uh, we trade a discount to our NAV, but our board's been very active and take that focus on the discount very seriously. And so I think we're the narrowest of the of the three Vietnam funds listed uh, on the London Stock Exchange this year, between 12 to 15% uh, discount. So the board's very focused, and we as a manager, super focused on building a good portfolio, names that we engage with, have you know, meaningful conversations around their growth prospects, how they're reporting uh, their numbers, and also how they're doing in terms of adhering to the ever increasing burden of ESG reporting, giving them some pointers for how they can make sure that they're well recognized uh, around that. So Vietnam, for us, it's a great opportunity. It's a growth market, multi-decades at six and a half percent GDP growth. Uh, and that's translated into you know a growing capital market opportunity. 1,500 companies in Vietnam, and we're building a portfolio of uh, you know, less than 26, 27 companies in that market. But you've got to be nimble. It's, it is an emerging market. Actually, by its technical definition, through MSCI and other rating agencies, it's still a frontier market. It's the largest frontier market. But it's got all the characteristics of, a, of an emerging market, the good characteristics, the good growth, the young demographics, the attractive prospects. But you know, the downside of any emerging market is that they can be volatile. So last year, the markets were down substantially. We outperformed in the down market. Uh, this year, difficult first half uh, of 2023, but um, markets have been picking up over recent uh, months. And it's relatively cheap, single digit PE. So a bit like the one of the investment trusts you just mentioned over there, you know, with the UK on 8.8 .8 times forward PE, I think you were saying. So uh, for Vietnam, we were looking at Good growth, a market where you've got more than 20% earnings per share growth for next year. And yet you can, you know, our portfolio is on about eight and a half times price earnings. So good value and, and, and good growth around that. We're not trying to do anything clever. We're just buying public equities. Uh, we're not buying private companies. These are publicly listed. Uh, we're working with teams that we've known for a number of years, trying to pick the best uh, in each of the sectors to find the the category killers, the category champions, uh, and then also what we call the rising stars. And we're able to be a little bit under the radar. Our size means that we're able to buy small, medium, as well as large companies. And we take a conviction approach as we get to know these businesses better. You know, they might end up at kind of eight to 10% of the portfolio, starting off maybe at a couple of percent in the portfolio. Uh, and we're active if they're going off the rails either in terms of their core business or in terms of their ESG, then then we cut them out uh, of the story for us. So 
it's good opportunities and we're just trying to do simple things really really well uh, in, in vietnam and it's you know a market with constant development and, and excitement we had uh, biden came to vietnam uh, last month and was trying to strengthen vietnam's relationship with the us it's position in in asia is is a very unique one it's at the boundary of northeast asia and southeast asia it's a very open trading economy it's close to 200% in terms of its import and its exports so it's on that measure one of the most open economies in the world it's high level of digital penetration on the internet rapidly growing e-commerce market so there's opportunities there for digitalization and our number one position is a key player in that but also for simple things such as banking there are more facebook accounts in vietnam than their bank accounts so clearly you know as people uh, get wealthier and start to access financial services they're going to want to use digitally enabled banks so there's a great opportunity there as well It's benefited from a lot of foreign direct investment uh, historically everything every category under the sun from running shoes and garden furniture but of course over the last few years also more high tech so it's a leading manufacturer of mobile device and accessories a leading manufacturer of laptops computers it products and also a leading exporter of software services around asia and our top holding fpt about 15% of the portfolio is is really benefiting from that trend where vietnam's got a good labor advantage it's got a very smart stock of engineers uh, there's 40% of vietnamese graduates are in science technology engineering and math so that's a couple of times the level of the us so it's got tremendous potential in its human capital a young population still a young uh, a large young population highly literate and really determined to go forward a couple of very key inflection points one is you know that gdp growth over the last 30 years if you look at that now on a per capita basis it puts vietnam at an inflection point its per capita gdp around $4000 thailand doubled from that level in about 6 or 7 years china within 5 years so we think that's an important point we're going to see the wealth of the people increase uh, that drives them towards modern trade in terms of the consumer experience opens opportunities there also in terms of uh, consumption of financial products um as well as uh, traditional consumption of uh, of goods and services so domestically it's a market to watch in terms of the rise of the consumer the rise of also the retail investor in vietnam many of the participants in the stock market today in vietnam probably 80 to 90% of the daily turnover are, are domestic retail investors so they do have money to invest as well as money to spend and uh, you've got a young digitally savvy population that's uh, able to di digest news from a whole range of sources and it's got a, a, a demographic that is the envy of many countries uh, some parts of asia are aging rapidly obviously people are aware of japan's aging problem but even thailand has an aging demographic whereas vietnam still has a, a strong swathe uh, of young people in its demographic sweet spot high level of employment and yet still a, an attractive uh, labor proposition in terms of wage for manufacturers so cheaper than mexico cheaper than china and for software engineers cheaper than india so for the young stem graduates the science technology engineering maths graduates you know there'll be tremendous opportunities both in their country choose that should they stay or or as you know vietnam vietnam does export talent around the world um so good demographics and vietnam's really got to this position through being this open economy after its war with the americans more than 40 years ago uh, vietnam opened the door to trade and has been a friend to all uh, and yet a servant to none as has built a very unique diversified uh set of countries that it trades with uh, and over the last few years it's been a real beneficiary of uh the move against perhaps people being so dependent on china and so we've seen uh, the china plus 1 story and and vietnam increase its exports dramatically to the us uh, which is also why biden was over to to see vietnam award the us 
with a co uh, comprehensive strategic partnership level, which it already has with China and Korea and a few other places. So there's a lot of interest in being a, a, a trading partner to Vietnam, uh, using its uh, resources for exports. So that drives a lot of the foreign direct investment that we've seen. And despite this year being a difficult year globally, the record levels of foreign direct investment into Vietnam, and most of it's going into the manufacturing sector. There's been a lot of talk recently about how uh, uh, and what role Vietnam plays in the semiconductor supply industry. Some mixed stories. There's some news about some people not increasing their investment in Vietnam. But there's news of others, particularly from Northeast Asia, of doing more investment in Vietnam in semiconductor assembly and test and in uh, design of semiconductors. Probably not going to see manufacturing of devices in the purest sense, like a foundry, but packaging, assembly, and test. Uh, and increasingly, we see people wanting to expand or, or perhaps diversify the supply chain, some to onshore back to the US, some to nearshore to places like uh, Mexico, uh, but also countries like Vietnam are still positioning themselves uh, for that. So you've seen tremendous growth over less than 20 years in terms of the manufacturing output, in terms of its growth and share of GDP, and the boom in exports uh, since Vietnam started to come onto the world stage 40 odd years ago. And it's been taking market share from China in the trade wars that kind of started the last time Trump got in the, in the White House. Uh, and then more recently, as people have been perhaps battling between the US and China as the he hegemons and who's going to be the biggest in, in the schoolyard, uh, that has also helped Vietnam's position uh, be cemented in terms of a, of a great place to, to be manufacturing. And the Vietnamese government is very adept at this and, and wants to court international trade, international investors. That's why they have 15 free trade agreements with various countries around the world, both bilateral as well as multilateral. It's got a very strong position with ASEAN as well. The other interesting inflection point that we uh, look at is the urbanization. That's the percentage of the population living in, in the cities. It's still very small. Vietnam's at 38%. That was Europe in the 1950s. And when China got to that level in 2000, it doubled again in 20 years. So we see that the cities in Vietnam will grow. The productivity will increase. Average incomes will go up. There's more efficiencies in economies of scale making the labor more attractive as well. And that urbanization will also see other benefits, uh, pushing modern trade, uh, increasing uh, the demand for uh, good infrastructure. And so the investments in infrastructure will have a multiplier effect on the economy. So it's got a long way to go, but it is growing rapidly, um, you know, getting to the levels of other parts of Southeast Asia. So the consumer's strong. Um, despite weaknesses in the early parts of the year, the prospects are high, particularly for this digitalization. So we're seeing, you know, 20 to 30 percent growth per annum in the different parts of the digital story, uh, both in terms of e-commerce as well as um, using you know, digital for financial uh, services and for uh, products and services uh, in the broader economy. So that's something to keep a very close eye on as that internet economy surges forward. And we see 35 million more Vietnamese middle class consumers in the next five to 10 years. So uh, a, a long way to go in Vietnam continues to punch uh, above its weight as the economy becomes richer. So we will see over time this changing retail landscape. It won't be anywhere near Singapore uh, or even uh, Malaysia uh, as we're showing on, on the chart here. but we are seeing uh, that modern trade penetrate more uh, as people are trying to get good value, but also in a safe environment with easy to understand product history. And so the consumer is becoming a little bit more discerning. And e-commerce, which we've seen through COVID, has certainly helped in that transformation. Uh, but a long way to go to, to catch up to the more developed parts of, of Asia. Um, so the macro is still strong. Vietnam's got record levels of foreign direct investment, record levels of trade surplus. 
Um, the, the export story has recovered during the latter part of this year. And yet, you know, inflation is not the concern in Vietnam that it is in other parts of the world. So modest levels of inflation. Uh, the government has been reducing inter interest rates during the course of this year. Um, deposit rates are coming down. Mortgage rates are coming down for investors. In fact, the mortgage rate in Vietnam is you know, maybe eight, nine percent. It's not far off the US, which I think is seven. So, um, you know, Vietnam's a different economic pulse to to much of the more developed world. And the currency, although it's been devaluing over the last 30 years, and this year we've seen a, a broader devaluation uh, in the context of what's happening in the rest of the world, we're seeing you know, a very strong US dollar. And actually, we're seeing you know, uh, the yen and other currencies in Asia uh, devalue faster. And so Vietnam is getting a benefit of on the import side. And yet, um, with uh, the growing strength of the dollar, it's you know, benefiting in terms of its, its exports as well through to the US and other markets. So the market is still a developing emerging market, again, with a caveat that it's still seen as a frontier market. Uh, we've seen strong levels of liquidity return to the market this year. It's the, the second most liquid market in Southeast Asia. Uh, a few weeks ago, daily liquidity at one and a half billion dollars. Um, and that's four or five times where it was you know, just a few years ago. So there's a lot of interest from the domestic investors. There's some exciting new developments uh, coming into place later this year in terms of the stock market infrastructure. Uh, and some of these will facilitate this continued growth in participants. There's two, 300,000 new accounts opened in Vietnam each month. There's more than 6 million stock investors, domestic stock investors in Vietnam. That's more than there are in the United Kingdom. Um, so that the, the market, there's a lot more interest. Your earlier comment was about how the UK market's becoming less interesting to investors. Well, you know, Vietnam's still got a long way to go. It's still a very young stock market, 20 years versus you know, 150 years. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of innovation in products coming to the market and ways that uh, hopefully the, the playing field will be leveled. And that's important because although Vietnam you know, it's an attractively priced market. It's got good profitability and growth. I've mentioned the good levels of liquidity in the stock market. It still is a frontier market. It's still quite difficult for investors to buy the market um, other than coming through funds like ourselves or, or other funds. It's uh, currently the largest frontier market that there is. But we hope and think that Vietnam, in the goodness of time, will get that upgrade to an emerging market status. And to, to get there, they will have had to have continued to innovate, to liberalize the market, um, to remove some of the perhaps the hindrances that foreign investors see. And some of those will fall away um, in, in early part of next year with, with new infrastructure coming to the stock market, a new, new stock exchange system that will remove some of the pre-funding requirements that are currently in place. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. These things take time. I think it's only once a year that the agencies kind of give an upgrade um, to the markets. And that takes a couple of years to go from kind of notification that you're on the potential shortlist to, to being included into the Premier League, so to speak. Uh, but I think it's a question of, of when uh, rather than if. So that's something for investors to look forward to in the longer term in Vietnam. So for us at Vietnam Holding, obviously, we're delighted that we've, we're winning awards. But we're just doing simple things well. We're looking at how uh, we can build a portfolio of companies where we can have meaningful conversations. And all of our team on the ground in Vietnam are engaged with our portfolio companies. We take ESG seriously. We've been a signatory of the UN PRI longer than anyone else in Vietnam. Um, and we find that this is important for keeping ourselves in check, but also gives us the tools and toolkits to uh, measure how our portfolio companies are doing on a whole range of standards, not just the environment, but also around governance and reporting, transparency. And so we can have uh, screening of our portfolio as well as ongoing engagement that we can kind of have a metric to see how our portfolio companies are doing. And we like to 
uh, do more around this, around the governance, around the ESG. We like to measure more because if you don't measure, you've got no way of seeing how well a company is doing. And then report more. And we encourage our portfolio companies similarly to do that. So it's a simple portfolio. We don't use any gearing in the portfolio. Uh, it's just buying good uh, listed equities and building a, a sensible portfolio and being uh, being nimble, being able to take decisions quickly uh, and be focused on uh, the new growth opportunities in the market and also you know, having a clear focus on any changing risk. And so outperformance over one, three, five, ten years uh, suggests, you know, we've been doing something reasonably well over that time through many cycles. So our portfolio uh, is quite concentrated. Top 10 account for about 60 percent across the various themes that come out of the Vietnamese story of the domestic consumption, that urbanization story, as well as the modernizing investments into the country for export, which is part of the industrialization story. Our number one holding FPT, uh, close to 15%, is, is a compounder. It's in education, it's in domestic IT, it's a large provider of uh, domestic uh, cloud services in Vietnam, but it's also a, a large provider of software to Japanese corporates and US corporates. 20% top line, bottom line growth, uh, a decade of 20 to 25% return on on equity. And it's also recently benefiting from uh, providing services to people looking at AI. So it's teamed up with um, a leading AI company to provide a stock of engineers that are trained on the latest in AI, including uh, generative uh, AI. Uh, and more recently, it's been growing its opportunity set in the semiconductor space, not building fabs, but uh, providing designs for uh, power chips, analog power chips, as well as digital devices. So it's a good domestic player in a modern industrializing economy like Vietnam, but it's also a great exporter of software, a bit like some of the you know, the big Indian software companies at the turn of the millennium. Um, FPTs really powering ahead on many dimensions, the education and domestic IT, as well as the uh, selling IT services globally from a relatively low cost base. Another interesting company in our portfolio is a, a company which is an, an energy transition leader. It's a business, PVS, that started out life providing services to the oil and gas in industry with a fleet of very specialized uh, anchor handling tugs, supply vessels, and, and storage infrastructure. It's pivoting. It's transitioning that infrastructure to service the growing demand for renewable energy, particularly when wind energy that's onshore as well as nearshore and even offshore, deeper sea wind energy. And Vietnam, a bit like the UK, has got tremendous wind energy potential. Um, it doesn't have the, the narrow uh, seas between the uh, UK and the rest of Europe. It's got a, a vast expanse of ocean to its east. And so you're getting strong winds coming in, and it has one of the highest wind potential in, in Asia. And there are plans to massively increase both the domestic amount of wind energy in Vietnam, and PVS is well positioned for that, as well as providing its expertise around the region. So in Taiwan, it's looking to implement, deploy, and maintain wind farms. And with Singapore, uh, you know, one of the most developed countries in Southeast Asia, PVS is looking to export renewable energy. So it's teaming up with a very leading company in Singapore to lay the foundations for a, a thousand kilometer undersea cable, which would be probably one of the largest in the world, which would be bringing the renewable energy that's generated in Vietnam, the surplus eventually, to, to Singapore and the rest of Asia. So PVS is a, a very interesting company in transition. Uh, and so we're you know, delighted to have added that to the portfolio. And it's got good growth prospects for next year, 30, 40% in terms of its earnings per share growth. So good growth and a reasonable valuation. And then finally, just as an example of one of our other sectors, we have Gemadep, which is a, a logistics champion 
It's got several ports that it operates throughout the country. And if you believe you know, that Vietnam is a good place for made in Vietnam, you can either pick an individual factory or a company, but that's quite risky. So our approach has been to look at the business to business service providers, the linkages in that chain. So whether you're buying an Adidas or a Nike pair of trainers, it's got to go on a container. And so Gemadep is one of the key players in both the sea cargo within Asia, as well as globally, and also in air cargo. And we see that it's a business that's at a relatively undermining valuation currently. And next year could grow its earnings per share by another 30 or 40% after a quite extraordinary year this year. I should say, however, a large part of its earnings per share growth this year was by being nimble around its balance sheet, by divesting underperforming assets and then putting the proceeds into new growth parts of its business. So it it booked quite some significant, perhaps one-off gains in 2023. But we see that its core business, the transportation, the logistics business, uh, will be in good recovery in 2024. And so we think it's good growth, and yet we could see its profit grow significantly uh, in 2024. So these are three of our portfolio companies, a digital champion, uh, uh, an energy business in transition, and also a logistics champion. And, and we do have some significant positions in a number of banks. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the banking sector as a whole, uh, we think has great prospects. We're actually underweight, not by design. Uh, we're about 30%. That's our limit in our, our fund for a single sector. The actual market in Vietnam is probably close to 40%. Uh, but nonetheless, we've picked a few solid banks and we see that that uh, sector will have long multi-year growth as the number of participants in the banking sector increases in terms of the customers, as the products become more sophisticated. And the banking is a great way to play the broader opportunity set in Vietnam. And the banks are, are relatively cheap. Uh, one to 1.2 times price to book, and yet with you know 20% returns on equity and, and good growth prospects. So we're happy with our portfolio. We're uh, nimble around the opportunity set, and our aim is to find you know, good compounding businesses and engage with each of them on their own development. We see some of them go from small cap, uh, PNJ Fun Nanjuri, our, our number 10 position on our portfolio, was $100 million only in market capitalization when we first bought it. And now it's north of a billion. So you know, we're able to see tremendous growth across some of the, uh, the portfolio picks. And that's leading to our outperformance. So easy to buy the Vietnam story. Don't bother with ETFs, but you know, have a look at uh, the investment fund opportunity and Vietnam holding uh, VNH is the ticker um, has demonstrated very strong outperformance to its peers, the other London listed funds, as well as the broader broader index. Great. Thank you, Craig. That's uh, covered a lot of ground there. A um, couple of questions that have popped up. I might drop around slightly. So uh, first off, thinking about that issue with the MSCI and the frontier market thing. Is it true that FTSE's already upgraded you or upgraded Vietnam to an emerging market? Uh, no, they're, they're looking at some talk around um, putting it on a on, on another um, kind of emerging market category sooner ahead of MSCI, but uh, not, not yet. Um, th there's a few of these kind of index uh, raters. So they're, uh, they think that the, path will become easier when the new exchange infrastructure is in place and the pre-funding of accounts has been removed. Uh, whereas for MSI's 18 checkboxes, uh, a large part of that's around foreign ownership limits and how much of the index is still constrained by foreign ownership limited stock. So uh, nothing e yet, but it could be the FTSE would be before MSCI. Yeah. And we have, we have seen in other markets where that's happened, so really enormous flows of money and quite big spikes in uh, the market. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, it's a couple of years out. Yeah, it's a couple yeah. of years out. Cool. Um, Vietcom Bank. 
Um, the, well, the question really is, is around state-owned enterprises and your and your your views on these and, and whether um, they're a good thing to own or something to avoid or and and is that one of those? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, um, there's always kind of like a uh, an understanding that if there's any you know state-owned enterprise or state involvement, it's a bad thing, which is not necessarily the case. Uh, in some ways, uh, the presence of, uh, of of the state in some of the sectors. Um, as long as they're opening up to foreign investors, it means they're perhaps a little bit more conservative in some ways, but also they can perhaps access cheaper funding um, and have greater scale. So I think we wouldn't go into an entity that's just a pure uh, state-owned entity and has no has not been able to demonstrate that it's changing its thinking and its product and its approach. So with some of the state-linked companies, you can still see tremendous improvements around that. And the stock market is only 20 years old in Vietnam. So many of the companies, a lot of them have, have been started through entrepreneurs, but many of them have had you know, historically state involvement to a lesser or, or greater degree. And some of them have emerged you know, like FPT and like Gemadep as you know, as foreign owned and, and, uh, and privately owned businesses that have grown great guns. Uh, but for some of the banks, they're still... In some of them, there's still um, state uh, involvement. That's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Sometimes they end up doing a bit of national service um, and you know taking on some weaker banks. That's something always to keep a, an eye about. But they've got a very strong position in foreign exchange, strong position in uh, being the banker's bank, uh, and also in partnering uh, with the growth and the investment in the infrastructure and partnering on the multilateral agencies, uh, ODA uh, from various countries and you know, people like ADB investing as well, they would partner uh, with Vietcong Bank and others as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's it, it's not a, 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 a barrier, uh, but it's something you've got to keep keep a, a close eye on, particularly for perhaps smaller companies, whereas Vietcong Bank is a very, very large business. Right, thank you. Um can you talk a bit about the IPO market and how that's been going recently and also your attitude and whether you would do pre-IPO investments, which I think you are allowed to? I think we are allowed to. The IPO market's been pretty much dead for a, a number of years. Um, obviously, you know, blame COVID or what have you for some of that, but um, there hasn't been a, a lot of new issuance. Um, there are a couple of companies that could come to market next year, uh, one in the auto segment uh, and one in a few other uh, areas, some real estate uh, players and service providers. But so it hasn't been a great source of new flow for us. We can do pre-IPO. So if there is a, a business that we think is attractive, we can certainly look at it. Uh, we did, um, about four years ago, we did a, a pre-IPO using a convertible note, a convertible bond into a into a private logistics company. It unfortunately didn't develop its plans to list, so we exited through the pre-arranged mechanism, putting the bond back to the company. Um, we did also do a pre-IPO five uh, years ago in a technology business, uh, and that didn't do very well. The market was not ready for it, so we have to be cautious around that. But we're hopeful that you know next few years we will see some more IPOs, but um, it's not going to be the mainstay of our of our portfolio for some time. Thank you. Um, so given the kind of concentration of the portfolio, how do you manage the risk? So in some ways, by having a concentrated portfolio, it means that we're laser focused on each of our holdings. So we've got a team of uh, 13, 14 people on the ground in, in Ho Chi Minh City. And so of our analysts, we can allocate people to specific segments and to specific companies. And so we review the whole portfolio, every company, on, on a very regular basis. Formally, once a, once a week, we're looking at each of the businesses, but informally through the course of a week. So it's by being very focused on changes in their uh, business environment, on their reporting numbers, and being able to react to it in a very rapid manner. If we see that the conviction is improving and that there's an opportunity to see them go through a kind of step change in performance. Or on the other hand, and we saw this a little bit a couple of years ago coming into COVID, 
some businesses weren't very prepared, weren't very transparent, and we were able to quickly exit them. Um, and then some sectors fall out of favor. So we were quick to reduce exposure to the real estate sector as that became a very difficult market about a year and a half ago in Vietnam. So we managed portfolio risk by being on top of it. Um, obviously, we do have some limits in terms of sector limits. Banks no more than 30%, for example, single sector limits. But it's really by um, knowing the business as well uh, and building that high conviction strategy. Start small, 2 3%. And then if we're really comfortable with those businesses, 8%. And if the businesses do really well, which some have done, of course, naturally, they, you know, they, they grow beyond our kind of uh, investment level initially. So FPT, uh, we can't invest in companies more than 10% at time of investment. It's risen significantly through performance. So it's being nimble, being focused. Uh, all we do is uh, is look at the stocks on a daily day to day basis and meet with the management teams regularly. Uh, and that's our best way for helping to mitigate risk. Uh, applying you know, sim simple kind of frameworks and actually using ESG, uh, perhaps not so fashionably, but using ESG as a as a way to kind of uh, measure performance and see if there's any deterioration on any of the key key areas that we want to watch. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked in that last question um, about the reduction in the real estate exposure. Given what we, you were saying earlier on about the rate of urbanization, everything else, is that something you might um, take back up again? Yeah, so there's, there's two parts of the real estate story. One is industrial real estate, which plays to the manufacturers looking to build for export, so industrial parks. So we've kept uh, strong allocations to that sector. But in perhaps the residential side, it it was clear it was going to become increasingly tough, higher interest rates, higher mortgage costs, and then uh, – delays in getting approvals and then some arrests in the real estate sector so we we really kind of reduced our exposure uh, and we're fortunate in terms of our timing but yes that urbanization trend as vietnam goes from 38 percent to let's say 55 60 percent urbanization it's got to build millions and millions of houses over the next few years um, and so it's a very strong long-term trend and so some of our core names that perhaps we have reduced them, we may well add, add back into over the next uh, year or so and you know, re repeat the, the growth that we've experienced with them historically. And historically, some of these names have done very well for us. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it makes sense to um, take some profit and, uh, and bide your time and, and come back in another, another moment. And so that may well be something that we look at for the real estate sector where we're currently underweight, but we may add back to that. Uh, in due course okay thank you um obviously this is a growth market and most of these are going to growth stocks but so you do get some yield uh, is there a plan to pay a dividend in the future um the dividend's currently reinvested there's about two percent dividend yield from from the stocks but at the moment that's gone into reinvestment and also the board have been doing buybacks and so that's funded part of the you know the buyback uh, but there's no move yet to adopt a you know, a, for, a formal dividend in that case, um, it's something the board review, I think, on a, on a regular basis. But at the moment, the dividends are reinvested. OK, fair enough. Um, can you say a little bit about what you've been doing within the portfolio recently, I'd say over the past six months, please? Yes, yeah, so we've been uh, cautious around, I see, on, on some of the real estate but also on, on the retail sector names that we have we've seen do very very well have had a difficult challenging start to the year so we've if you looked at our portfolio you know a year or so ago you'd see some of our uh retail names much higher uh, are much more prominent in our top 10. um so we've just been a little bit cautious on we, this they've still got great businesses uh but we've found better growth prospects in um, some of the other areas, both in, in some of our banks, some of the stockbrokers, as well as uh, some of the industrial uh, providers around that. So we've been, um, we haven't been doing a great deal of trading activity. We're, we're long-term investors around that, but we are able to you know, trim our sales 
as we come into you know stormier periods of time, which certainly was the case at the back end of last year and the beginning part of this year. Uh, but now we're you know assessing each of our of our sectors um, and trying to find the new rising stars as well. So about seventy percent of our portfolio now is in the in the large cap that's above a billion dollars. And historically, we've done also very well in mid cap companies that have then grown. So you know, we keep an eye on some of the uh, a couple of new names that we're starting to allocate to. So we're doing a lot of research into a couple of names that aren't yet in the top ten. Um, but may well make it there um, through either their performance or through uh, increases in our conviction. So we've been looking at a few new names to have in the portfolio for next year. Great. Thank you very much, Craig. That's very interesting. Um, I still do, do you think it's an exciting market. So um, good luck with no, that. Thanks, James. Yeah. yeah, much appreciated. And we shall uh, follow you with interest and, um, well, we, we keep writing notes on you. And then... Um, We'll get you back in a year or so and see how things have gone. But um, Look forward to that. Right. Thanks again, James. Okay. So back next week, talking to AVI Global. Uh, then Richard's going to be talking to Supermarket Income REIT the week after. Um, and then we've sort of got a program through. We're, we're starting to fill up January now. Um, I didn't put them on here yet, but uh, we have got a sort of lineup developing. As always, if there's somebody you particularly want to hear about that we haven't talked to recently, then do shout and we'll we'll try and include them. But otherwise, um, thank you for today and uh, have a good weekend and we shall see you next week.